sort of think of ourselves as being kind of the leaders in this field, actually, of computer reconstruction. Um, but lots of other people are doing it around the world. I don't think particularly following our example, but simply it's, um, it's, it's time has arrived. Um, so we wanted to uh, get on to, onto the record the um, kind of uh, current practices of what's going on you know, with an international flavor as well. So the first day was kind of an international day, as it were. Um, and today is, is really local, so as you can actually see uh, what's going on here, and you'll be able to talk to people about how, how this sort of restoration work is organised. So it's kind of tend to be sort of a hands-on, practical uh, thing today, of just sort of uh, finding out sort of what's underneath the bonnet. And the second reason was that um, the museum is in the process of trying to get a, a, a credit, um, and uh, British museums have an accreditation program. Um, and um, if we think of ourselves as the National Museum of Computing, um, we want to be on a sort of a, on a, an equal par uh, with um, with other other museums, so that we can exchange goods, share archives, and so forth. And that gives us a sort of premature to do that. Um, and one of the things we need to do uh, was to become more sort of academically engaged. So we've organised this conference. Um, very much on the lines of an academic conference with, a, with proper proceedings. Um, and incidentally, the proceedings that you have are, are drafts, and we're going to invite all the speakers to, if they want to sort of revise their papers, uh, to do so in the next month or so. Um, and then we'll put it online, so we'll have a formal publication with the museum's name, name on it, and just sort of uh, enhance our kind of credibility. Um, so, the program today then um, is what we're doing is we're having five talks this morning, which will kind of orientate you, uh, so that when you go to to see the various exhibits this afternoon, um, you will uh, sort of know what's you're prepared for it. Um, so the speak, first speaker then is is Delwyn Holroyd, um, who actually is really one of our most active uh, conservers. Um, he's worked on the WISH project, um, on the, the HEC project, you'll see these hand place today, um, and also on the ICL 2966, um, which really was the last of the, of the British um, kind of mainframe uh, creations, the 2900 series. It came the 3900 series eventually, but all the architecture, so it was the last great British computer project. Want to take up? Yeah, absolutely. as well as other things in the museum, but what I'm going to be talking about today is the 2966. So, um, Can I just confirm there isn't a draft paper on this presentation? That's right, there isn't, there isn't, there isn't a draft paper. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, I realise that not every, some people will be very familiar with this machine, others will not, so what I'm going to do this morning is really just try and orient everybody and give you a bit of an idea of what you're going to be looking at this afternoon. It's a very big machine, there's lots of components to it, it could easily just end up being confusing. So I'm just going to give a very brief run through of what, what kind of technology we're talking about, what we're dealing with. So this was a mid-range mainframe system, so it wasn't the fastest machine when it was new, it was a general purpose business machine. Um, instruction time was 80 nanoseconds, which if you work it out is about 12 and a half megahertz. I would caution trying to compare that to contemporary microprocessors because it was a pipeline machine and so on. So this was a, a, quite a powerful machine at its time, but obviously not a supercomputer level. 32-bit processor, 8 megabytes of RAM, uh, which by the way takes up an entire cabinet, which we'll see later, and 7 gigabytes of total disk storage on the system which fills most of our large systems gallery. And if you think at the time that PCs in the mid 80s were maybe 10 megabyte and a half disk, so this is a, a lot of storage at the time. Uh, it has a number of peripherals, card reader, line printer, and four magnetic tape decks. 
And uh, if we turned all of the peripherals on, which we never do, we'd be looking at roughly 60 kilowatts of power consumption, which we'd probably bankrupt the museum quite quickly. <laughs> so we're more like 15 kilowatts on a typical day with what we run, which I'll show you later on. So a little bit about the history. It came to us from Tarmac Quarry Products in Wolverhampton. Um, it started out life there as a 2950, which was the predecessor um, systems from the late 1970s, and then in 1988 that was upgraded to the 2966 that we have now. And that ran until 1999, when uh, unfortunately it had to be decommissioned because some of the operating software they were using turned out not to be Y2K compliant. And to be fair, it probably was in need of replacement by then anyway, but it, that was really what um, really forced their hand to do that. Um, it was moved to, um, sorry, it went into um, storage in 1999 in Bletchley Park. This is before this museum actually existed, so it was the predecessor organisation to the museum that it was actually donated to. And it wasn't until 2007 that we had the resources to be able to move it out of storage and into this building here, H Block, where it sits at the moment. Um, by 2009 we started restoration and then in 2014 we reached the first sort of major milestone, which was running of an operating system, which enabled us to run a service for users so that they could actually interact with the machine. So a little bit about the architecture. 2900 architecture um, was known as the, uh, the new range from ICR when it was first begun. And uh, that was in about 1968, just on the formation of ICL itself from its constituent companies. And uh, 2900 architecture was designed from the ground up, so it wasn't. It was. It had other machines that it was based on, and there are people in the audience I know will have opinions on that. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to go into it now, just to, to avoid starting a war. Um, <laughs> so it was designed around the concept of virtual machines and virtual memory from the beginning, which was both of those things being quite innovative concepts in 1968. It was designed to run uh, compiled high-level languages efficiently. And what that meant was it had hardware features for things like procedure calling, array indexing, and so on. Um, all memory access was done through descriptors. That's a little structure that specifies where a buffer is in memory and crucially how long it is. And so that obviously uh, helps to avoid the, the bane of today's software, buffer over and buffer overflow issues. It also had multiple access levels. So instead of there being simply a kernel and a user level, there were many access levels and software could only transition from one to another through very tightly controlled interfaces. So again, that was a, a security feature that meant that it was very difficult to hack the machine, if you like, and, so, and give yourself very high privileges. And the first machines were actually launched in 1974, and they were known as the P-Series, 2970 and 2980 machines. Um, our machine is from a slightly later series, from the, it was launched in 1982. Um, and there were a number of variants of that, of that machine with different model numbers um, over the sort of early to mid-80s. And then uh, the next major, or last major, um, uh, advance in the architecture came with Series 39 in 1985. And that introduced nodal architecture. And what that meant was you could take individual processing nodes and connect them together with fiber optic connection to create multiprocessing systems with a single system image. Uh, and that was a great advance upon the previous uh, methods of, of creating multi-processor multi, uh, systems. <coughs> and the other advantage of that fiber optic connection was that you could actually have those nodes physically located up to several kilometers apart uh, for disaster resilience purposes. So um, from the early 90s onwards, they, um, although the architecture continued, it became too expensive to build these kind of custom processes that you see in the 2966 and the, indeed in the early series 39 and they began to emulate the architecture on commodity hardware so we actually have an example uh, in the museum of a system like that called the trimetro dy system which you'll see next to the 2966 and that one is actually based on an intel pentium pro processor which emulates the 2900 instruction set and the software and so on um, it's still in use today the architecture, just about, um, for certain government applications, shall we say. Uh, it's met, the, the applications were mo mostly public um, companies in, in the first place, but that's really all that's left now. So let's go on to the technology. So the machine is based mainly from TTL. Um, 
TTL, if, for those of you not familiar with electronics, it's a very um, cheap and widely available set of logic, and mostly it's still available now, either still manufactured or available new old stock. Um, the rest of this machine, in particular the main processor, or OCP in the ICL terminology, is made from ECL logic. Again, it's a common series, and it uses dynamic RAM for the store. Um, this was the last model of the uh, 2900 architecture to be based on this kind of commodity parts. So the, uh, the Series 39s that followed were based on the Fujitsu LSI technology. Of course, the problem there is that with custom parts, they're not available anymore. There's zero chance of remanufacturing them. So really, this is one of the last machines that we could contemplate restoring to operation. Um, it's built around what's called an SCU, a uh, store control unit, acts like a hub that all the other units in the system talk to. And uh, so those other units being device control units, which are sort of standalone processes that manage all the peripherals. Uh, we have a system control processor, which is, when you see it later, is a, a unit that has the, the screen and keyboard on. And that has a dual purpose. It's both for engineering diagnostics, <coughs> and it's also used as the operator's console when you're running an operating system. And then the audio code processor, or OCP, that's a CPU, um, you might also call it. Four main components there. Scheduler um, is the, component, the hardware component that actually takes individual instructions and converts them into a set of microcode tasks, which it then hands off for execution. And uh, these were designed so they could take up to two decoders, so it has a, a native 2900 decoder. Uh, it also has space for another one, and we have the 1900 decoders. So the 1900 series was the pre predecessor architecture before 2900 came along. It was also one available for System 4, which was the other main um, ICL mainframe architecture that was still supported at the time. Now the idea, I, I'm fairly sure, was to enable customers to migrate efficiently from and easily from 1900 or System 4 onto 2900. However, in practice, a number of customers didn't make that migration and just treated the 2900 machines as a faster 1900. <laughs> and that includes our machine. So our machine spent its whole working life in 1900 mode. So just a little on the other units, the engine itself, it's pipelined as I mentioned, um, it plays this microcode which is called MICOS2. Um, it has a store access unit, which is the, the component which issues requests off to main store and also contains a data cache to increase performance. And then it has a diagnostic module, which um, allows the, the system control processor in its engineering mode full access to all the registers in the machine. If you're familiar with electronics, this is similar to JTAG that we have today, scan chains. Uh, and it does mean that the uh, SCP can pull off fancy tricks, so everything is parity checked within the machine. If something in an internal pipeline in the processor detects a parity error, the system control processor can stop the clocks, back up, retry, and thereby potentially avoid a system crash that would have been an inevitable result in earlier machines. So, how are we doing for time? Right, so disk technology. Um, we've got several different types of disks. So they all use the flying head principle, um, and we'll go on to that later this afternoon as to why that's not a great thing. <laughs> Restoration. Um, two removable types, 80 megabyte and 200 megabytes there. Um, I won't go through all the parameters. And two fixed types, the FDS 160 and 640. I'll leave you to guess the capacities of those. Um, and they were a very similar technology, but they used sealed um, disk and head assemblies to enable a slightly higher density to be achieved. So, why restore? Well, we've heard quite a lot on this from previous speakers yesterday. Um, from our point of view here, and with the 2966 in particular, one of the major reasons is this is computing on a large scale. Most visitors have never seen anything like this machine, and even people who programmed on these machines may never have actually seen them because they were hidden in machine rooms and custom and, and uh, near programmers did not have access. So, uh, crucially, it needs to be running to get the full experience, so you need to be able to hear it, you know, you hear the sounds, the heat, the, the noises the peripherals make, it's a very tactile kind of machine, and, and that's really why we wanted to restore it to operation. And of course, no similar uh, machine note from ICL or indeed any other mainframe manufacturer is working uh, in this country on, on public view at the moment. Um, crucially, the technology, as I mentioned earlier, makes it practical. Um, any later machines, we would be looking at severe difficulties with keeping it running long term. 
Um, so those LSI components are, are really the killer, which we don't have in this machine. Uh, the availability of documentation. Um, we're lucky enough to have literally tons of manuals that came with the system. And we also have um, about a million of these aperture cards, which <coughs> represent the ICL master document archive. And this is every technical description and circuit diagram and so on produced by ICL from about the late 60s up to mid 80s. Um, the only problem is we don't have an index, but there are ways around that. Um, but this has been incredibly helpful. We've been able to get circuit diagrams for things that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to, to uh, repair. Um, and finally, availability of software for the machine. So um, not only do we have diagnostics, which on a machine of this complexity is essential to have the diagnostic software to aid you in actually fault finding on the thing. Um, we have operating system software. And crucially, we have compilers in a number of languages, which means we're able to create new software for the machine to demonstrate it. Because there's no point just having a machine there that isn't able to run anything. So now, just quickly, I'm going to. Oh, have I got more time? Okay. So just quickly to run through the restoration progress. Um, obviously, this will make more sense when you see it later on. But just to orientate you, so back in 2009, um, we got the system control processor working, and uh, by November, the device control unit was passing its internal self-test. Now, those two components are essential to do anything else with the system. They manage the boot process, so we had to get those working first. And the next step after that was to construct a virtual magnetic tape deck that interfaced directly onto the DCU and enable us to put in um, the initial stages of the boot software, which we've got, um, as, I, as I mentioned, preserved already in modern format. <coughs> Um, however, to get further, we really needed the diagnostics, so um, then we turned our attention to one of the EDS-80 exchangeable disk drives. That was working by May 2010, and it worked for long enough for us to get a disk image at low level of the diagnostics disk. Um, there have been problems with it later, which I'll come into this afternoon. But that gave us um, the ability to run the customer test suite, also customer test software, which is the diagnostic suite for the machine. And what that does is it basically tells you what boards are faulty or where to, where to start looking for, for any particular fault. And it does very uh, thorough testing of every, every piece of logic in the machine. So moving on then, by um, September 2011, we had the, the main processor working, by which I mean it was able to run a primitive level instruction, so assembler code effectively in the 2900 mode. Um, following which we built a new peripheral interface which was a bit more um, capable than our previous laptop um, interface that I mentioned earlier. So what that enabled us to do was to drive directly the Mac Tape Deck's card reader line printer as if they were talking to the processor. And conversely, we could also switch the mode of that, hook it up to the processor and it could emulate any of those peripherals, which gave us a way of bringing in virtual cards or virtual tape and so on, and doing virtual output. So the real card reader was working by 2013, and then the next major thing that we needed to do from there was to build an emulator for the disks. So we realized that the disks, well, we realized very early on the disks were not going to be reliable enough in this environment to, to run them um, every, every day. We just, we just end up with head crashes and we very quickly run out of, of um, disk packs. So building a disk emulator became a high priority um, at this point. That was complete by September 2014, and I'll show you the emulator later and talk a bit more about it. And that enabled us to move on and actually run a real operating system then by November 2014, initially just on one terminal. Uh, we then moved on and started looking at some of the other drives. We restored one of the larger FDS640 drives, and we don't run that frequently, but it is now operational. And then we acquired uh, in September two more terminals of a different type, so one open terminals. And these added to the user experience. So obviously it's a multi-user machine. We now have the ability to have multiple users using it. Uh, November 2015, we've got the two of the main, uh, the main tape drives working. Um, these have been very useful, not so much for running the system, but for data recovery for other people and so on. And also they look great for visitors. And then in 2016, um, we got the second of the system <coughs> control processes working. And that is a necessary precursor to being able to run the real 2900 operating system, which is BME, uh, on the machine as well. So 
that's it for now, and hopefully you will come and join me at some point this afternoon on your allotted groups, and we'll go through in a lot more detail what people want to look at, and I'll be able to demonstrate the system for you. So, thank you very much.